durante, uh, ao longo da minha vida profissional, uh, tenho tentado encontrar taglines, uh, umas mensagens finais para encerrar os noticiários que tenho vindo a apresentar, que de alguma forma correspondam à estratégia editorial que é desenvolvida num determinado momento e que façam uma leitura do tempo histórico que vivemos. Digo isto porque durante vários anos encerrei o telejornal da RTP1 com a expressão uh, é este o nosso mundo, boa noite e até amanhã. Uh, tão simples, mas, reflito agora, também tão ilusório, tão simplista, na verdade. E quando não houver amanhã? O até amanhã deixa de fazer qualquer sentido. Uh, é uma certeza como aquela da água, que só sentimos a falta dela quando abrimos a torneira e afinal percebemos que é extraordinariamente difícil e penoso não ter acesso à água. Uh, é este o nosso mundo, mas qual mundo? Qual nosso? O mundo é feito de milhões de mundos, cada um de nós é feito de muitos mundos diferentes. E é esta a lógica do universo terrestre. O mesmo conhecimento científico que nos tem revelado, ainda que lentamente, mas uh, de uma forma certa, que é este o funcionamento do universo, é o mesmo conhecimento científico que nos diz, de uma forma inequívoca, que nós estamos a matar os nossos mundos. A Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos e a Fundação Oceano Azul consideraram que não seria possível dedicar dois dias de debate sobre o que podemos fazer para salvar o mundo sem eh, termos uma outra noção de que um mundo é, afinal, composto de muitos mundos. E é esse o papel do nosso primeiro orador. Um homem que não conhece apenas as grandes metrópoles do mundo ocidental, mas que sabe o que são os cânticos da chuva indígenas, que conhece a aridez magnífica da terra do fogo, e a imensa vida da estepe, de origem francesa, filho de mãe italiana e pai canadiano, foi professor no Uganda, em Singapura, no Malawi, em Inglaterra. Acabei de saber que esteve há poucos meses em Moçambique, ali atrás do palco. Viajou, observou e escreveu. Escreveu O Velho Expresso da Patagónia, Comboio Fantasma para o Oriente, Sul Profundo, o grande bazar ferroviário. Chamou ao palco o professor, escritor e ser humano, Paul Terrou, para nos falar do grande bazar do mundo. Senhoras, e senhores, muito obrigado pela vossa amável recepção. Agradeço também a Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos o convite para este auspicioso evento. É um prazer revisitar Lisboa, a vossa antiga é linda cidade. Eu passei aqui a minha lua de mel sob o encanto do fado. A minha primeira lua de mel. <risos> Se é outro casamento. É outra lua de mel. <risos> de qualquer modo, Estou feliz por estar de volta. E assim, prossigo na minha língua nativa. O título é Memórias do Futuro. Los Uh, recuerdos uh, del porvenir en español. Thank you very much. Okay, you understood that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so my subject is memories of the future, or, or th this one, uh, the bazaar of the world. You're here for a reason, and the reason is we're wondering about the future. That is the worry, the anxiety of everyone on this planet, every human being. 
What's going to happen to us? What will become of us? What's going to happen? What will the world be like? What's in store for us? And this uh, condition has a name, chronophobia, chronophobia, fear of time passing. What's going to happen? You all feel this anxiety. And for this reason, the wish to know the future, a whole occupation has arisen. The soothsayer, the witch doctor, the haruspex. The haruspex is a Greek person who opens the entrail, open, cuts a bird open and looks at his entrails, his guts, and tries to tell the future. When I lived in Africa, the most important, I lived in Malawi. Maybe some of you have been to Africa and maybe to Malawi or to Mozambique. Malawi is right next to Mozambique. The most important person in the country was not the prime minister, not the president. It was the local witch doctor. Why? Because he could tell the future. He had the power, the power of prophecy. In the Bible, the Bible is full of prophets. Um, so the most respected person in any society is the person who can see the future. This is why, uh, you know, in, in um, Macbeth, Shakespeare's Macbeth, Banquo says, if you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak to me then, who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. So look at these seeds, which one will grow? Who is he asking? He's asking the witches. <laughs> so uh, I tend to think that one of the ways that we can have a, a hint of the future is perhaps through travel, the way I've lived my life. People sometimes say to me, I've been to Bhutan, I've been to Nepal, I've been to China, I've been to Machu Picchu, I've been to the Algarve, I've been to Porto, <laughs> I've been to Sevilla, uh, I've been to India, and I say, I've been to a place you have never been and will never go. It's called the past. The past. The past is another country. People do things differently there. And you can't go there. But I've been there. So when I, uh, I think age um, is a help. But also the way travel itself, not official travel, not travel on the red carpet, but travel in the old laborious, difficult way, by land. I once went from Cairo to Cape Town. I went by land. I went down the Nile, then through the Sudan, then through Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, through Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe, then Mozambique, and down Johannesburg to Cape Town. I never took a plane, and I learned a lot. I never met an important person but I met many people. I started my life as a teacher in Africa and in, uh, in Malawi. It was called Nyasaland then. And when I was, I was 22 years old. I stayed there for two years and then another four years in Uganda and I've gone back repeatedly. Very early when I was a teacher, I said to the class, what would you like to do when you grow up, when you're much older, what would you like to do? And they'd say, I want to be president. I want to be a politician. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a teacher. I thought, this is great. That was in 1964. The country became independent in July 64. And I, after when I went back to take my trip from Cairo to Cape Town, I went back in the same classroom and asked the same question. What would you like to do? What, what would you like to do? I went back to my old school. What did they say? I want to leave. I want to go to America. 
I want to go to Europe. I want to go to Portugal. I want to go to Australia. Get me out of here. Different. In, it, it had been 30 years. So there's so many unexpected features that I had come across. Uh, 60 years of adulthood. So I was talking about the past. What are the main differences? Of course, you all know what the differences are. Rise in population. Scarcity of drinking water. The disparity between rich people and poor people. The erosion of press freedom. The disparagement of journalists. Donald Trump talks about fake news. But no dictator likes a free press. They disparage journalists. So that's, a, that's something that's come. If you travel in India and you talk to an Indian in, who's read the Sanskrit, you'll say, what's going to happen to us? And he'll say, what's coming is the Kalyuga, Kalyuga, the black age, the age of darkness that's coming. In Indian scriptures, um, the next age is the dark age, Kalyuga, Kalyuga. So when I lived in Malawi, um, that was in the years of Salazar and uh, uh, Mo Mo Mozambique. I lived right on the border. So I went back and forth to a place called Villa Cabral. And I went back and forth. I drank the wine, Vino Verde, lovely. And I talked to people there. <laughs> and if I talked to a Portuguese colonial, a, set a settler there, I'd say, why did you come? And they would say, I came because my village in Portugal has no electricity. But here in Villa Cabral, we have electricity. Uh, how long you stay? Forever, for the rest of my life. Any, any settler in Mozambique. So what happened? Well, you know what happened. In, in 1974, I mean, the, whole, the world changed. The, uh, and forever changed. So there was a war in Mozambique and Angola. And what looked like we're here forever didn't happen. So one of, the, one of the great lessons of travel is becoming acquainted with the reality of change and unexpectedness. So um, even now, if you go to Angola, you won't find many Portuguese there. What will you find as colonial? Chinese. The Chinese in Angola, Chinese in Mozambique, Chinese settlers, Chinese who left to start a new life, small business, competing with uh, Angolans or Mozambicans, and uh, they leaving China. What does that say? Well, when you see a Chinese settler in Africa, that tells you a lot about conditions in China. So looking at, at a Chinese settler, you, you begin to understand life in China. In 1973, I was in Vietnam. I was in Vietnam during the war. I was a journalist in Vietnam. And it looked like it was going on forever. It looked terrible. OK, in terms of the future, even Americans said the domino theory that one country was going to become a communist, and it, it's the end for us. Actually, if you go to Vietnam today, some of you have been there, you'll see Vietnam after the war is a flourishing place. It's busy. Uh, it's profitable. They're self-sufficient in food. No one expected that. No one expected that. The Americans thought, we're going to destroy North Vietnam's government, we're going to take over, and we're going to make it a capitalist society. Actually, it, it, it sustained itself as a socialist uh, society, but with great capitalistic instincts. They're great manufacturers. So we were wrong. We were completely wrong about that. I went to um, China, down the Yangtze River, 1980. What I saw looked like the highest stage of poverty in China. Dirt roads, no private cars, uh, factories, very old-fashioned factories. This is 1980. I went, stopped Wuhan, Hangzhou, Suzhou, all the way down from Chongqing to Shanghai. It looked so strange, but there were still Maoist slogans, defeat the imperialists, defeat the running dogs. 
I said to um, an American on this trip, so what's going to happen here? He said, I have no idea. He said, he, he said I don't know. But he said an interesting thing. He said, with these factory, a factory that makes cannons or guns or tractors can also be retooled. It can make cars. So he said, we'll see what happens. But I said, it, the country is so poor and so suppressed. Everyone was wearing a blue suit. Well, anyway, I don't have to beat a dead horse, but if you go to China today, that's not the case. No one expected that to happen. On my way to China, I stopped in Germany. I took the train to China. I stopped in Germany, in Berlin. I said to a German friend of mine, this Berlin is so strange. So you have East Berlin and West Berlin, and Berlin is in East Germany. It's absurd. He said, I know. I said, how do you live with it? He said, well, we live with it. I said, will it ever change? He said, I have no idea. That was in 1986. What happened? Three years later, the whole thing changed. Everything changed in 1989. Um, in a very, I, I was in the Pacific in, uh, this would have been 1989-90, in the Solomon Islands. In the Solomon Islands, there's a bird called the Megapode bird. He lay, the megapode lays eggs in volcanic soil, and the eggs hatch in the sand because the sand is very warm. And they harvest the eggs. So I went with the chief. I said, this is interesting. You have, you get the, the bird lays the eggs, and you dig up the eggs, and you eat them. He said, yeah, it's wonderful. So many eggs. I said, but if you dig up all the eggs, what will happen to the birds? He said, ah, oh, there's plenty of birds. I said, why don't you set aside one month and let the birds hatch? He said, that's a good idea. But he didn't do it. So <laughs> if you go there, it's called Savo Island. It's near Guadalcanal. If you go there now, there's no megapode birds. Or let's say there's a couple. But in whatever that is, 17 years, the birds have been eliminated, more or less, from Savo Island. Did they expect that? No, they didn't. You know who Jack London is? Jack London, Call of the Wild, um, the Yukon, White Fang, To Build a Fire. Jack London was a great traveler. He traveled in England, he traveled in Alaska, he traveled in the Pacific, he was in Mexico, he was in Russia. Jack London also was in Hawaii. I live in Hawaii half the year. So one day, Jack London, in 1916, Jack London and his wife were on the beach in Honolulu. And there was a little, they were staying in a little boarding house um, on the beach. And he said to his wife, his exact words, I'm glad we're here now. And his wife said, what a strange thing to say. You're glad you're here now. Why? He said, because someday this will be one big hotel from here to there, hotels. She said, really? If you go to Honolulu now, you'll see one long hotel. He had traveled a lot. And it's interesting that he said that. Because he had traveled, he saw how things changed. You know, Jack London died when he was 40 years old. He said that when he was 38. But what he, his prediction in 1916, 100 years later, came true. So there is such a, I, I began by saying prophets. There is such a thing as prophecy. But, but there is an aspect of prophecy which is possible to, to seize if you look carefully. Do you know a writer? called James Agee. James Agee wrote a book called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, an American author. I'm going to read a quote, his quotation. He said, For in the immediate world, everything is to be discerned for him who can discern it. And centrally and simply, without either dissection into science or digression into art, but with the whole consciousness seeking to perceive it as it stands, 
so that the aspect of a street in sunlight can roar in the heart of itself as a symphony, perhaps as no symphony can. And all of consciousness is shifted from the imagined to the effort to perceive simply the cruel radiance of what is. Perceiving the cruel radiance, no, radiating, of what is. A, a Zen scholar, D.T. Suzuki, said, what is the nature of freedom? How can we be free? And he said, to see things as they are, to see things as they are, not as you want them to be, not as the government tells you they are, but to see things as they are, not from the red carpet, but as I said, the old laborious overland way, to see things as they are. When I was in China in 1986 and 87, there was a lot of disruption and in the rural areas. And dem the, the democracy movement was very strong in the rural areas of China, the, sp the small cities. So I wrote a book called Riding the Iron Rooster, and it was about my, I took every train in China. And by the way, you know that the longest railway journey you can make is from here, Lisbon, to Hong Kong. You have to go to Paris, then Berlin, then Warsaw, Moscow, Moscow to Irkutsk, then to Mongolia, then to Datong, then to Beijing, then to Shanghai, then down Guangdong, Hong Kong. That should be on your bucket list. <laughs> it's the longest railway journey in the world. Anyway, I wrote the book, uh, and I mentioned the, the discontent in rural China. When my book was published in 1988, my review, the reviews for the book were very bad, or they're very mixed, actually, saying, I don't know what I'm talking about. China is reforming. Uh, it's great. They're making uh, toys. They make shoes. They make everything, uh, manufacturing. And it's liberalizing, and the people are happy. And my book was seen as negative. But it wasn't negative. It wasn't positive. It was seeing things, the cruel radiance of what is, seeing things as they are. So when the 1980, I got bad reviews, but one cure for bad reviews is good sales. So the book sold very well. <laughs> so I was happy about that. That was 1988. And people were saying, I don't know what I'm talking about. What happened in 1989? Tiananmen. The Tiananmen. And how many people were massacred? You don't even know how many people were massacred. Maybe hundreds, maybe thousands. No one knows. You know, it was, you know who Mao Zedong is? Mao Zedong was a, a monster, <laughs> was a tyrant, but now and then he would said something that was true. And what he said was, all genuine knowledge originates in direct experience. That's the experience of travel. When I say I was bent to a place, the past, is the direct experience of the past can inform the future. When I was in Africa, I uh, became friendly with the writer V.S. Naipaul. You know who V.S. Naipaul is. He won the Nobel Prize uh, in 90, I think he won it in 91 or 92. But he was a good friend of mine. I wrote a book about him uh, that came out about 96 or 7, I think. And I was a young, I was 24 then, he was 34. And he was very, uh, critical of what was happening in Africa. Particularly, he said, the Indians in Africa have no future. I said, actually, they have shops, they have money, they have, and they have a, they have, um, a, 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 they seem to have a basis for relating to Africans. They also spoke Swahili, and when I was in Malawi, they spoke uh, Chichewa. Mumadzima Chichewa. Mukudzima? That's if your face is ugly, learn to sing. So I, I, <laughs> I could understand. And I said, these people could understand. The language that's also spoken in Mozambique, Chichewa, lovely language. 
Walila uh, Mvula, Walila Matope, they say in um, Mozambique. If, it, if you're asking for rain, you're asking for bun. Naipaul didn't get this at all. I told him this. He said, no. And we he would see an Indian, and he'd talk to the Indian, and he'd say, after, I said, what did he say? He said, he's a dead man. He's a dead man. And I said, so, what do you think's gonna happen? He said, they're all gonna leave. They'll be chased out. He said, this, this government's gonna get rid of them. Um, and he was right. I did see, I had lived there, but it didn't occur to me. Um, I thought the Indians there had come from India. They were, um, they didn't observe caste, they, they adapted. A lot of Indians from India uh, learned how to be aliens by living in Africa. The experience of going to a country like that is you begin to understand alienation and you begin to understand how to live with people. It happened, actually it happened in Angola, it happened in Malawi, it happened in Mozambique and Kenya and elsewhere. Later, Naipaul wrote a book about India called An Area of Darkness. Then he wrote another book about India called India, A Wounded Civilization. Then he wrote another book, India, A Million Mutinies Now. In that book, this last book, this is what I want you to remember from this talk. He said, I believe that the present accurately seized foretells the future. I'm going to repeat that. I believe the present accurately seized foretells the future. And he felt that in India. I thought, that's a great lesson. I have no idea what's going to happen to the planet. I mean, it's a very strange thing. In 1985, I wrote a novel. It was called Ozone. I, wrote, I actually started in 1984, 1985. It was a book about the future. And I thought, I want to write a book set in the future, a future that I might live in. So I chose the date 2020. I said, this, this book, this novel, takes place in the year 2020. It's next year. The novel, Ozone, was published in 1987. 1987. What did I predict of the future then? Well, I predicted that people would live in secure areas with a perimeter, that, the, that gated communities, I thought gated communities, I thought, um, so that all cities would have a kind of perimeter, all a, a, a suburb would have a wall around it, either a notional wall or a real wall. The, uh, so I thought a gated community. I thought security would be a problem. I thought that um, immigration, that alien, that, that people from the undeveloped world or underdeveloped world would, would come and that, that they would feel, they would try to enter the first world, as it were, and that there would be an underclass of aliens. When I say aliens, of immigrants, of uh, undocumented or illegal immigrants. I predicted um, wastelands. Um, one thing I felt was, in a world where there's so much nuclear energy, that there would be a disaster. It hasn't happened, actually. There hasn't been, there's been a lot of nuclear um, accidents, but no gigantic one. Maybe it will happen in the future. It, it, when, with this, so, it, it's almost predictable that, that some sort of nuclear accident will happen. I, I felt that in the book. But in a small way, I thought um, that the world would be pretty much the same, but emphatically different in, in particular ways. Immigration, I thought, would be a problem. Security would be another problem. Um, you know, nine countries have nuclear weapons. China, France, Russia, the United States, so forth, Israel. They have a lot of them. Uh, it's surprising that it hasn't happened. What I hadn't expected, what you can't predict, but it happened, was that New York was attacked. New York City, big, prosperous, wonderful city. The anniversary was just the other day. New York was attacked attacked by planes flying into buildings. Who would have thought that? 
um, it's, it was a very strange thing, unpredictable. But then it became possible for people to believe that a city like that could be attacked. Um, I grew up in the 1950s when the US population was 150 million. Now it's 330 million. If you can imagine a, the, twice the number of people, you begin to understand how different a place can be. And many people think that natural resources are salvation. For example, Angola has oil, Venezuela has oil, Nigeria has oil. If you're looking for three dysfunctional countries, it would be Nigeria, Angola, and Venezuela, particularly Venezuela. When I say dysfunctional, I only mean that the billions, say 75 billion in, in oil revenue, or 96 billion in the case of Nigeria, you think that's going to enrich a country, but it didn't. In, in Lubango, in southern Angola, the students have no textbooks in the schools. Uh, there's a Chinese shop, okay, that's good, but the roads are very bad. Same thing in Mozambique, same thing in, in Venezuela, it's, it's, it's a failed state, although they have oil gushing out of, the, out of the ground, they have plenty. The same is true in Turkmenistan. I was in Turkmenistan, I think it was uh, 2007, they have natural gas in Turkmenistan. But the people in Turkmenistan have the craziest government imaginable. So you need a number of factors, not just natural resource, but wisdom, leadership, a free press. And I would say that the free press, the transparency is one of the most important ones when we think about the future. Um, so based on, well, the, the Congo is another, what country has more resources than the Congo? They have gold, they have oil, they have silver, they have bauxite, they have diamonds, copper, they have timber, they have everything in the Congo. But the Congo is a nightmare. It's a nightmare. They have no roads in the Congo. It's, it's, it's totally dysfunctional. This, there is a government, but um, it doesn't function in all the areas. So they have all the resources, but they need, obviously, leadership, unity, and, and, and some sort of fairness. Um, so, we come back to prophecy. The, the traveler can be a prophet, and prophecy is a wonderful thing, but it varies between scientific observation and, and just a party trick, like reading, reading your palm. The first of two considerations is as Naipaul says, one way of foretelling a future is accurately seizing the present. If the ocean seems to be in trouble now, in slight trouble, if it's not remedied, it's going to get worse, obviously. If a, a glacier is melting now, it will go on melting unless we take action against it. If there's plastic bottles, like in the lobby, <laughs> the entrance when you came in, if you see those in the ocean, there's going to be more of them unless we take action against them. So we have to take action, observe it, and then publish it. So we need the freedom to, publishing it, to publish it. It's a thrill to be correct in prediction. And I will say there's a whole genre of fiction about the future. There are even Portuguese novels set in the year 2040, or the year 3000. Um, I made a note of them. The 1984 is a novel about the future, a bit like mine. 1984 was years and years ago, but people still think about 1984 as the future. Why is 1984 the date? Because Orwell wrote it in 1948, when he felt that totalitarianism was taking over the world, and that, and th that governments, totalitarian governments, were mendacious, they were, they were lying to people. So did it happen in 1984? 1984, you lived, most of you lived through it. Did it happen? No, it didn't happen. But what did happen? Not the government, not the, the way the society 
was predicted by Orwell, but a way of thinking has happened. When Donald Trump attacks the press and says, the press is lying, that's 1984, that's Orwellian. Newspapers lie to you. The government, newspapers lie to you. Fake news. Journalists are the enemies of the people. Journalists are the enemies. That's Orwell. So, people not dressing like 1984, not, it's not um, uh, the aspects of the society that, that he, he described is not the case. But the thinking, the thinking that he predicted, uh, which is, as in the German prison camp, work makes you free, Arbeit macht frei. Work, that's an Orwellian sentiment. So, uh, the sense of prophecy that we see in books about the future, and there are many, many books written in the, in, the, in the 18th and 19th century about going to the moon, going to the moon. The moon was present. There are probably a hundred books, a hundred novels written from, from, the, from the 16th century to the present about going to the moon. People were obsessed with going to the moon as though that was going to be a salvation. But people were thinking about novels about going to the moon, the future, from you know, for hundreds of years. It's a whole genre. So, it's disappointing to be mistaken in a prophecy, our prediction. But I'm a writer, and prophecy is not my business. What is my business is observation, and I suppose experience. The more detached you are in travel, the less you see. People say, Luxury travel is wonderful, but luxury travel is wonderful, but it shows you nothing. People go on safaris in Africa and have a wonderful time, but the person who lives in a village in Africa, a small village in Africa, for a year or two, knows more about the future of Africa than any red carpet, any official visit, or any safari goer will find. And I found living in an African village taught me a great deal about what was to come. It's much more important to see the world as it is. The condition of the oceans, the condition of the land, the science of climate change, the eradication of species. As I said, I live in Hawaii. We've lost many species of birds in Hawaii over the years for a lot of reasons. One, the introduction of cats. So cats come, people say, oh, it's a little pussy cat, but the pussy cat multiplies and they've killed the ground feeding birds. The future, if we have a future, will be based on the freedom to observe. However the future is constituted, the most important thing is to be able to speak the truth, to write it, to disseminate it on the internet, to broadcast it, to publish it, and to have events like this where you are concerned and I am concerned, and this foundation sponsors it, we're all concerned. This is important to me. This is like, we're like early Christians meeting to discuss what's going to happen, except it's not a religious revival that we're seeking, but this is like a, the church contemplating the future, the congregation contemplating the future. The future of the planet depends on the freedom to see things as they are, and to observe and report the truth. So if something good comes out of this event in these few days, it will be the ability to publish the truth and to meet with people of experience uh, who have studied the problem, who've lived long enough to see how the world changes,
maybe travelers. Tomorrow, John Kerry, former Senator Kerry, will be here speaking. Our government has many people who talk about war, who talk about conflict, and send soldiers into battle. None of them have been soldiers. John Bolton, former uh, secretary, uh, Donald Trump, Dick Cheney. You know who Dick Cheney is? Former Dick Cheney was the Secretary of State under George Bush. None of them were soldiers. All of them advocated war. Ask John Kerry tomorrow what he thinks about going to war, and he'll give you a better answer. You know why? Because he was a soldier. He was in Vietnam. He understands the nature of war. Colin Powell, who was also a soldier, was not a warmonger. Who's the best person to judge whether we should go to war? A soldier, someone who has seen war, not someone who had deferments. Trump didn't want to go. He, he said, I don't want, I don't want to go. I, I'm, my, I have a problem with my foot. Dick Cheney had five deferments. And by the way, Dick Cheney is my age. He's exactly my age. So we grew up in the same, in the same world. And one that I joined the Peace Corps and went to Africa, he went to Washington and became a powerful politician. So I also think this. If we are convinced that we can see the future, that also might be a problem because we have to keep an open mind. Travelers know that there's no ultimate destination. And the great challenge in travel is the unexpected, the bombing of New York, the attack on New York, the disruption at Tiananmen Square, the failed states of Africa, a country that has a lot of money and a lot of oil that's still poor. That's unexpected. My students in Malawi used to say, if only we had oil, we'd be free, we'd be better. They might have been cursed, they might have been worse off if they'd had it. One of the great satisfactions in travel, you could say one of the great satisfactions in life is uncertainty, is not being exactly sure, not getting it from the witch doctor, the soothsayer, or the scientist, but being unsure. And why? Because the unexpected, the events that we never thought were going to happen, are those experiences that test our imagination and our adaptability. By not knowing the future, we stay more alert. Do you understand what I'm saying? That, that we don't, we're not sure, so we have to stay vigilant. And our not knowing, but our studying, our continual studying of it, keeps us watchful in our observations and if they're reported truthfully with a free press, television, and the internet, reported with authenticity and truth, that will keep us strong and help us showing the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, if you have any, are there any questions? I don't, I'm not sure how we're going to ask the questions, but if you have questions, I'm happy to um, answer them. Yes. I don't have any microphone here, anyway. You don't have a microphone. Yes. How do you see free press if free press today doesn't have enough, enough financial resources to go ahead? Okay, th here's the question. How can you have a free press if you don't have financial resources? Well, that's a very, very interesting question, and I, I don't even know the answer to it. But I can say that 
there's something called the underground press. In the Soviet Union, there was something called Samizdat. Samizdat was, was a way of promoting information and, and talking about the government and the conditions with very little money. It was just done by word of mouth. It's true that the press is controlled, obviously, by wealth and influence, but the commitment of, of, of the press has to be to disseminate truthfully and, 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 for, to, to, um, and for, for people to have access to it. You might say that one answer might be that the internet is not expensive and that a lot of news that we get is on the internet and we, we get it. I must say the internet also has a lot of misinformation on it. But the press is now evolving from newspapers that people bought and read. The newspaper is probably antiquated, even books. A book now, if I publish a book, it will be half the, will be a book that you read like that. The rest will be a Kindle, a, a electronic, an e-book. E-books are very cheap. How much does it cost to just send a text of a book? So maybe the answer is that the liberation will come th through electronic media and not through traditional media. Traditional media is very expensive, other media is not. But I hope, I mean, I don't know whether that answers your question. I don't know the answer, but I think that, that the, the electronic media requires less money and if people trust it, if they, if they have uh, faith in it, uh, that may be the way forward. There will come a time, obviously, the New York Times is the magazine, of, of the, is the newspaper of record in the United States. People trust the New York Times. Sometimes they get things wrong, but usually it's a, a, a newspaper of record. There'll be a time in the future when the, news, when the, when the New York Times will not be a paper, it won't be, not be on paper. Possibly in your lifetime, in my lifetime. It won't be a piece of paper. It will be an electronic on a screen. Will that be expensive? No, I don't think so. I think it will be a lot cheaper. So I think it's possible. Uh, but, it, but, it's, it's, but it's absolutely essential. It's essential. And so what I'm saying is that if we don't, that the, that the, that the, that, that the crisis that we're facing is in freedom of the press, freedom of the media, and seeing things. Rather than being told, no, climate change, we have a government to say, there's no problem. Like, climate change, not a problem. Extinction of the species, not a problem. Uh, clean water, not a problem. Well, all of them, they are problems. So the, the problem is not with the press, the problem is with government, and then being able to report on that. Any other questions? Uh, yes? Okay, that's a complicated question. The question is, how? The, it's it's not despair in, in Malawi. I, I think in third world countries, in Africa and South America, it's not despair that people are. are, are well, it's dis disenchantment, disappointment. Despair it means, for me, you give up. But disenchantment means, I don't like it here. I'm going there. Uh, it's, it's looking for another 
opportunity? How do you replace it? It's a very difficult question, but one of the reasons why people leave countries to go to more developed countries is the developed countries need their labor. Britain imports nurses from South Africa. The National Health Service in Britain is staffed by South African nurses. Who needs nurses? Britain or South Africa? So South Africa obviously need, they need doctors and nurses, but they, but Britain, I know this as a fact, Britain encourages talented professional medical people to come, to leave their country. Then what happens? Bill Gates or Apple or wealthy people send nurses to South Africa to work for two years. So when I was in Africa, one of the uh, problems was a lack of medical people. It was a serious lack. No dentists, no doctors, no nurses. So they started a medical school in Malawi, in Kenya, in Uganda. And they trained doctors. But none of the doctors stayed. So to have people stay, you, need, you not only need to train them, you need to encourage them to believe that they have a future. You have to pay them, obviously. And they, they need to understand that they have a future in the place where they were trained. I, I think they have an obligation to stay for a certain period of time as doctors. How do you replace, how do you encourage, uh, the, the question is there, despair. How do you replace despair with hope? Money, stability, the future. You have to convince people that they have a future and that, that things will be different. But if the government is a dictatorship, if there's no security, if people want to educate their children, they go to another country. They would come to Portugal, they would go to Britain, they would come to the United States. So it's believing, most people who leave are leaving to enrich their families, their children. The, I've been traveling for the past three years in Mexico. The Mexicans who come to the United States would prefer to stay home with their family, with their food, with their, uh, 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 with their community. They don't necessarily, they want to come to the States and work in a hotel. They would like to stay in their village. And so I traveled all over Mexico, driving my car all over Mexico. And that's what, what, what struck me was they don't really want to come to the States, but they have to because they have no money and they have no, uh, they, they want to educate their children, they want clothes, they want food. They need to because they feel deprived, particularly in Oaxaca, some of you might have been to Mexico, Oaxaca, and Chiapas. The, um, the per capita income in Chiapas and Oaxaca, Mexico, is the same as Kenya and Bangladesh. So if you, <laughs> they're earning the same amount of money, or the, the per capita income is the same, Bangladesh and this part of Mexico. If you go to Mexico City, you say, this is great, this looks like Lisbon, this is wonderful. Food is wonderful. But if you go to the hinterland, and this is why I say if you travel and you want to understand a country, go to the, cross the border, cross the frontier. Go to the hinterland. Go to a village. Don't just stay for a little while. Stay for a long time in a small village and you'll understand it much better. So I think to understand how despair can be turned into hope, a place it's not the urban areas that should be studied, but, but the interior, the, the, the heart and soul of a country, rather than its capital city. I told you that the, the Portuguese migrants who went to uh, Mozambique weren't from Lisbon. They were from small villages in the north, small villages with no electricity, and they had a well and a bucket. And they just wanted a better life. So the better life was in Africa. I mean, they went, they went in search of a better life. Not, they weren't racist, they weren't imperialists. They were people who were trying to improve their life. And then in 1974, they came back. But they came back to a different country, obviously. I think, unless there's another really urgent question, I want to thank you for being such a lovely and attentive audience. I think this event 
is very, very important. The idea, this is a big question, the future of the planet. It's the question in the back of everyone's mind. Not what's going to happen tomorrow or next week, but where are we going? How are we going to get there? And will our children be safe? Thank you very much.